so as you know, we're here to, uh, to hear a talk from Jeff Jarvis and to engage with him um, in a lively fashion, I'm sure. Um, before introducing Jeff, let me just remind people of the, uh, the house rules and norms. So the rules are very simple. This is being webcast. It is being recorded forever. So um, if you <laughs> say something you don't want made public, yes, I'm aware of the irony, Jeff. Then, <laughs> then stifle yourself. Um, also, there are uh, copies of Jeff's book, books on uh, book on sale in the back of the room afterwards. Thank you, Carrie. There, there it is. Uh, Jeff, I'm going to obligate Jeff uh, to sign, autograph any of those. Okay. Um, and other than that, uh, I think we're pretty much ready. So uh, it's uh, just a treat for me to be able to introduce Jeff, Jeff Jarvis who I both admire and, um, and like as a friend. Um, I hear him on the radio all the time. My wife calls me in when she hears him on the radio, says, Jeff's on, Jeff's on. And every time I'm just so happy that um, Jeff is one of the people who speaks for an open internet and for fresh thinking about old media. Um, and now is um, with, with his new, new book, but it, expressing an interest he's had for a long time, is this, uh, somebody who speaks openly and clearly and forcefully uh, about a really difficult and important issue, which is what's happening to privacy and publicness. So Jeff uh, teaches at the City University of New York, Entrepreneurial Journalism, I believe, um, which is actually a wonderful title uh, for what Jeff does. Uh, not all of you know that he was a founder of uh, Entertainment Weekly that he was a TV critic for TV Guide, that he has <laughs> very serious um, old media, traditional media cred. I mean, he, he's, he's been there. Ruined by working at TV Guide, but that's. <laughs> <laughs> and has become, as you know, one of the most uh, important and, and clearest voices um, oh as God. our culture tries to figure out what's going on with media and with privacy and the other issues that Jeff deals with. So, um, without any anything else, here's here's Jeff. Thank you, David. Uh, I love being at Berkman. I, I I'll take any excuse I can to hang out here and, and breathe the smart air. And um, <clears throat> that's a hint. I'd like to hang out more. Uh, uh, I, we were reminiscing about uh, the first blogger con that Dave Weiner organized uh, here, and. Um, this is a, an amazing institution, uh, Harvard itself, but Brooklyn itself is, that, that does great things. So it really is an honor to be here. Uh, I'll talk for a little while, um, but then I'm, I'm eager to have the conversation, especially with you. And what I really want to talk about, um, not that I can decree that, but what I really want to talk about is, is preserving the tools of publicness, that is to say the net, and, and get there. But then that's why I wrote the book, is you know, some measure of, of fear about that. Um, but I, want, but I had to get there through a path of looking at privacy. And I want to emphasize that private, because Dana Boyd would shoot me if I didn't do this. Um, uh, David and I agreed today that everything we've learned, we've learned from Dana Boyd. Um, <clears throat> that these are not in opposition, privacy and publicness. That is a continuum. As uh, a CBC host said, it's like wet and dry, hot and cold. Uh, privacy and publicness depend upon each other. We all have private lives. I have a private life, believe it or not. Uh, privacy matters, privacy needs protectors. But my fear is that we're concentrating so much on protecting privacy in this digital age that we might lose sight of the benefits of publicness and then lose sight of the necessity uh, to protect those tools and what they can bring us. So that's why I wrote a book about publicness. And by the way, I'll also, while I'm doing caveats, yes, I know publicness is a terrible word, but the proper word publicity is just too freighted with marketing meaning. Um, the book was just translated in French, and to my amazement, there is no word for privacy or publicness in French, they said. Uh, so they had to use privacy in English, and they made up a French word, publicitude. Um, <laughs> it's about as bad as publicness, I think. Um, so um, let me just talk for a minute about, about the history of privacy. And, and in this august hall, I'm not going to act as if you don't know who Louis Brandeis is, as I do elsewhere. Uh, but uh, I didn't realize that the first serious 
discussion of a legal right to privacy didn't come until 1890 with Brandeis and Warren writing their historic Harvard Law Review piece. And as you know, I bet, the cause of their nerves was the invention of the Kodak camera. And um, a cannon. Well, uh, may Kodak rest in peace and Rochester with it. Um, uh, the, the town that digital killed. My, my, my son went to the University of Rochester first term, so first year. Um, uh, there were great clips I found in the New York Times of the time talking about fiendish Kodakers lying in wait. And Teddy Roosevelt uh, banned Kodaking in public parks uh, in Washington for a time for fear that he would have a picture taken and his children would have a picture taken. And of course now we all die to say hi. Uh, and, and we all die to get our, our pictures taken. Uh, so what I saw is the, the, the connection between fear of privacy and technology. That new technologies come in and they cause change, they cause disruption, they cause fear, they cause an effort to try to hold off the change. And I think that's part of what we're seeing now. I don't mean to diminish privacy to just that by any means, but I think that's part of the reason that we concentrate so much on it. And you know, you go through um, uh, other technologies through time, even back to the Gutenberg press. <coughs> Pardon me. The, when, when Gutenberg created the press, uh, as authors, we were amazed that anybody, some authors, didn't want their names associated with their thoughts set down permanently and distributed widely. Um, it freaked them. Um, Jonathan Swift has a great quote of the time, I'll get almost right, that a book of verses uh, seldom read and kept in a drawer is like a virgin much sought after. But once published as a book, it's like a common whore anyone can buy for two crowns. Um, uh, you, know, you go through other technologies, uh, little microphones and video cameras, and uh, these days uh, RFID chips and so on, and each causes some concern. And what we're really trying to do as a society, I think, is find new norms and new structures of how we deal with this. And the response, though, is to try to legislate and regulate to maintain the old definitions of where we are. And of course, we always look at the future in, in the definition of the past. Uh, printing, when it was established, was called uh, automated writing. Uh, the car was the horseless carriage. And that's the way we're looking at the internet now. Um, so it's somewhat of a history of, of privacy. Uh, on, on the side of publicness, uh, you know, the obvious is that, 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 that you go back, well, let me go stay on privacy for a second more, um, that some say the privacy was invented in, in, in England with the invention of technologies, in a sense, of the hallway and the back stairs. And before that, you walk through rooms and you walk through everybody's business. Obviously, in the villages, it's said we knew each other's business. No one ever knew what was going through our head. Uh, but, but again, we're trying to figure out norms as, as we go. So publicness, um, I'm going to make the risk here of quoting Habermas, and, and some will get mad at me for not doing it right. Uh, but um, uh, you know, we all know that Habermas says that uh, the public sphere began in the 18th century with the rise of rational critical debate in coffee houses and salons um, as a counterweight to the power of government. There were some uh, researchers and academics uh, in Canada and the US uh, brought together by a professor of Shakespeare at McGill in Toronto over the last five years, who did a project called the Making Publics Project. And I, 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 it was like manna from heaven for me in the book because it was a wonderful bit of work that they did. And they, they all came together in a room like this um, when they started the project. And Paul Yakin in the head said that they wanted to look at the tools of making publics in the early modern period. And one of the academics put his hand up and said, well, of course, you know, none of us believe that because Habermas says it started in the 18th century, so it didn't happen. And indeed, they had, they had to grapple with this idea for quite some time. But they came to the idea that people did have the tools of making publics in the early modern period well before the 18th century. Uh, Yakin, as a, as a Shakespeare scholar, you know, just, just saw it under his nose when he realized that if 3,000 people went to the Globe Theater to watch Richard III, they were gathered around an idea of what do you do with an incompetent ruler. Um, and that, that, that those are people who didn't know each other but created a public around an idea. Uh, printed sermons, printed music, art, markets, um, uh, all these things enabled the creation of publics. 
uh, that uh, when, when people's portraits were painted, you could get an idea of that's what a, uh, a, a Dutchman looks like. And when that Dutch person is in Venice, you could say, aha, that's them and this is us. You start to get an idea of a public. So they argued this, I think, very eloquently, far better than I just did. But I'll come back to that idea of the tools of making publics. And I think uh, that's what the internet really is, and that's, and that's where we are. Um, well, in fact, I'll go back to Habermas. Um, you know, he says, of course, that what ruined uh, this golden age of the making of the public sphere was mass media. And uh, my thought is that we've reached a time when we can tear back down what mass media did to us. It made us into a mass, first off. Raymond Williams, the sociologist, says there are no masses, only ways to see people as masses. Uh, mass media uh, talked to us one way. Mass media pretended to speak for us, uh, pretended to be the device of the public voice. Um, and now we have the opportunity online with the internet to each of us make a public. Um, and perhaps one of the best examples of that is uh, Occupy Wall Street. Um, and obviously before that, the Arab Spring, and before that, the indignados of Spain. And let me tell you a little story uh, about this as a tool of publicness. I have a rule in the book uh, that's the Cabernet rule. It uh, says one should not uh, blog, tweet, or do anything else public after too many glasses of Cabernet, uh, which I violate regularly, uh, as you can tell. And so one night in the midst of the so-called debt crisis uh, negotiations in Washington, I, I, I was pissed off and I had a few too many glasses of a fine Pinot Noir, which I can say in a law school was a loophole around the Cabernet rule. Uh, so I go to my keyboard and I go to Twitter and I'm just pissed, so I just say, fuck you, Washington. It's our money, it's our economy, you're messing with it. And people encouraged me, which was the wrong thing to do. And so I kept going. And um, I, I laughed and they said, well, we should start a chant here on Twitter. And some, somebody came in and said, you idiot, that's called a hashtag. Right. Fuck you, Washington. Now, some then got mad at me because I was um, falling into the Tea Party view of just being angry at government. There were a few people who live in Washington who, who took up a bridge, which of course was just stupid. Uh, some said I should have gotten mad at the GOP or at this particular politician or that particular politician. But what I learned something in the next 110,000 fuck you Washington tweets that followed, <laughs> which was, and I'm so proud. Uh, I just hope that doesn't end up on my gravestone. Um, <laughs> it, it could say, you know, fuck you world, yeah. Uh, um, People used it as a platform. They finished the sentence. F you, Washington, for making my parents nervous about whether they can pay their bills. F you, Washington, for not being able to negotiate as well as a three-year-old. F you, Washington, for not letting me marry who I want to, and so on and so on. And so I realized, learning from that, that it was a platform. And people imbued in, in this empty vessel what they wanted to in terms of their anger and their frustration, uh, and their hopes, for that matter. And Reuters later did a, uh, a look back at the use of uh, Occupy Wall Street as a hashtag. And the first English language reference, I'm proud to say, was in a tweet that I did not do, someone else did, that said nothing but hashtag fuck you Washington, hashtag Occupy Wall Street. Um, separated at birth. And, and so that's what I learned, I think it taught me about how to, how to judge Occupy Wall Street. That what frustrates the institutions, of course, is that it's not an institution. It has no leadership. It has no spokesman. It has no creed. It has no message. Uh, what the hell is it? Well, it's something that people can convene around. It is, the, it is a tool to make a public. True, truer words never spoken. Um, and that public is now trying to discern what the meaning is and to negotiate it in ways to figure out what, what are we pissed about and what is it we want. And it happens in a new and messy way. It happens as a network. To play to my friend Dr. Weinberger here, whose wonderful new book coming out in January, uh, I just finished. And it really, really is very, very good. But, but the network is the public. Right? And that's a different way to judge this idea when we had institutions as publics. I went off my script here. Um, so, um, right. 
we're going through a huge transition and trying to figure out what that means, obviously, as a society. And some of the, I also got some more manna from heaven thanks to Berkman because I watched a video, probably of a Berkman talk, uh, on the Gutenberg parenthesis. Were any of you at that here? No? Wow. On uh, forgetting suddenly, damn, the name of the professor who was here who did it. But it's a bunch of academics from the University of Southern Denmark. And they talk about this notion, I, lo I love the, the, the poetry of it, the, the Gutenberg parenthesis. And they argue that before Gutenberg, knowledge was passed around, scribe to scribe, mouth to mouth, change along the way. Um, it uh, had very little sense of ownership or authorship. Remember, the authors didn't necessarily want to be associated. It, um, uh, it was meant to honor and preserve ancient knowledge more than current knowledge. And then in the parenthesis, once after Gutenberg, they argue, knowledge became linear. You know, McLuhan says the line, this sentence is an example, is, is that organizing principle. There's a beginning and an end. There are boxes around things. Um, uh, it's about a product more than a process. There's a clear sense of authorship and ownership. Witness the problems we have now with copyright. Uh, it uh, honored current knowledge and authors uh, who created this knowledge. Then we come in their argument to the other side of the Gutenberg parenthesis. And on this side, it doesn't really necessarily return us to what's before, but there are similarities. Knowledge is now passed around link to link and click to click. It's remixed along the way. There's less of a sense of ownership and authorship to the consternation of copyright holders. Um, it's, uh, here I, I, I quote Professor Weinberger, Dr. Weinberger, that it's, it's, it's the, the knowledge we revere starts to become the network. And so our, our notion of knowledge, our notion of the world, our cognition of the world changes. When America was discovered, it freaked people out alone because that's not the world we know. It changes other things in the world, and that's what we're going through now. The CTO of the Veterans Administration calls the internet the eighth continent, and it's kind of the same. It's, it's the creation of a new space. I think there's some danger about, about calling it a space. Well, actually, here's the man who taught me. I used to think that the internet was a medium because we in media look at the world godlike in our own image. And we think that, that the world is what we want to do. And Doc yelled at me nicely, as the way only Doc can, and said, no, 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 it's, it, that brings a lot of baggage, Jeff, that it's a place. And there are some people now who say, well, the place metaphor has a problem, too. All metaphors are wrong. All metaphors are wrong, absolutely. Yeah, yes, yeah. Um, well, I, I was at the EG8 in Paris uh, and I, uh, I'll get to Sarkozy in a minute, but I mentioned the Eighth Continent, and he quite liked it, which was what scared me, because I think he had a vision of putting his flag in it, right? <laughs> um, right, so the Gutenberg parenthesis. So uh, these academics argue that what was happening in our culture was that it was a very hard transition into the parenthesis, and we're going through an equally hard transition out of it. And that we went into it, uh, you know, we still looked at things in the analog of the old. Uh, Again, the Gutenberg press was seen as automated writing. Uh, the, the, the fonts mimic scribes' handwriting. Elizabeth Eisenstein, the key scholar of Gutenberg, says that uh, the book did not come into its own form until 50 years after its creation, and its impact on society wasn't really truly recognized for 100 years after its creation. Um, indeed, if you look today at how newspapers, magazines, and books treat the computer online and the iPad, they're still recognizable as newspapers, books, and magazines. Right? We haven't really rethought and reinvented what information and knowledge can be. We're still looking in, in the horseless carriage, the automated writing way. We're, we're still looking in, in our analog of the past. So um, all right, let me come, come back to that. Um, sorry. I changed my order because of where I am, and so it, it throws me. Um, so, uh, again, I dealt a lot with, pri with publicness, but I still had to get through kind of the gauntlet of privacy. I had to understand privacy somewhat. And so I looked not only at the history, but I tried to look at definitions. I tried to find a good definition of privacy. And I, my, my incoming definition was that it was about control. And that seemed pretty clear and pretty sensible. It's the one that Mark Zuckerberg uses a lot. But I think it's a, a very inadequate definition. And I found that privacy is, is very much an empty vessel word itself that uh, one scholar of privacy said that it means everything and nothing. Um, it, it involves all kinds of different things thrown in there. I, I couldn't find a good um, legal definition that satisfied me. And I, and I came to believe that privacy 
should be seen as an ethic. That there's an ethic of privacy, and that is an ethic of knowing someone else's information. So um, if I tell David something, that information is now public to that extent. And what happens to it now lies with David. The responsibility is on his shoulders. Um, and he has to make decisions, ethical decisions, one would hope, um, about the context in which it was shared. Uh, is this something I wanted shared beyond that? Would that hurt me if he, if he shared it? Does he want to hurt me if he shares it? Um, uh, as an individual, if, if, if David were a company, there fall other responsibilities that, that one should secure this information. And Sony, you shouldn't let it all be stolen, or a bank, right? Um, I think there are further ethics for this age that say that uh, we should have, we whose information it started with, should have some access to it. We should know who knows our stuff and what they're doing with it and why. Uh, I also think it should be portable. That if uh, you know my, my Amazon uh, purchases, I would love to export from Amazon and use otherwise because they're my purchases. And the fact that I can't, docs rules will fix with VRM. Um, so if privacy is an ethic, then I think publicness is also an ethic. And publicness, I argue then, if privacy is an ethic of knowing someone is an information, publicness, publicness, I think, is an ethic of sharing one's information. And, and, the, and I do not argue for a moment that everything we do should be shared. Uh, when you do sound checks for radio and they ask you to say what you had for breakfast, I now refuse saying that we Twitter users are accused of talking about nothing else. So you will never catch me saying that I had a bagel for breakfast. Um, so, we shouldn't share everything, but there are reasons to share things. There's a generosity to sharing that can help other people. And so as an ethical nature, we have to ask ourselves, why not share that? At a personal level, I shared my prostate cancer online uh, when I got it, which means that I was sharing for the whole world my malfunctioning penis. Uh, not necessarily easy to do. Um, and why the hell would I do that? Right? That, that seems like the, the height of insanity. There's nothing more private, nothing we protect more than health, right? And uh, this is, you know, private information about private parts, for that matter. Uh, why would I do that? Well, I got great value out of it. I got support from friends. There were, in fact, indeed, there were friends who I didn't know would have the operation. And the only way that they knew and could share help with me that I was going to have the operation was because I was public about it. One friend, uh, Andrew Tyndall, who's, a, who's an analyst of TV news, uh, sent me an email in which he listed in incredible detail what was going to occur, so I just knew. Um, by the way, I'll make clear here, uh, when I got the diagnosis of prostate cancer, my doctor said, if you're going to get cancer, this is the one to get. You know, it's, it's, it's cancer light. So I, 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 I don't mean for a second to act as if this is uh, anything um, heroic at all. You know, you, they fix it. It's fine. But Andrew came in and told me all this stuff the doctors you're not going to tell you about, about love making and things like that. And uh, then he came onto my blog, because I'd written about it on the blog, and I said I was doing that for people who followed on Google, for people who were going to search on prostate cancer on Google. He said, okay, if you're doing it, I will too. He listed that and more. Another guy came in and um, listed a whole bunch of stuff that he wanted to tell us about, and he did it under a pseudonym, which I understood. But he came back the next day and said, hell, if you guys are doing it with your name, why shouldn't I? Um, a woman came in and told about her husband. She lost prostate cancer. Uh, they met about the time, they fell in love about the time that he had the diagnosis, and he refused to get treated because he wanted to be, in his words, a full husband to her. She said, nonsense. No, but he waited too long, and she lost him. And you tell that story, that story has motivated people to get tested for prostate cancer. And I think that's really important. Jenny Jardin, the magnificent Boing Boing blogger, uh, decided to tweet her first mammogram. Two friends of hers have been diagnosed with breast cancer. That motivated her to go and do it. And she did it in public. She did it far, far braver than I because I waited till after uh, I, I had the diagnosis. She went in and, and tweeted the process, including the diagnosis of cancer. But the outpouring of support she's gotten, and I think, I, I firmly believe she will, she will inspire more women to get tested and that Jenny will well save lives because of this. So there's a generosity to sharing. That's why I see it as an ethic. Um, talking about this, though, I think it's important to try to uh, underline the benefits of publicness. If we're going to talk about the fear of privacy, if we're going to talk about everything goes wrong, we should also talk about what could go right. 
Now, some might accuse me, some have accused me of being a utopian. I'm not, because I'm not predicting a better world. But I think that we must imagine the edges of possibility about this world and all the changes we have. So yes, we're, we're imagining the worst that can happen. We're trying to guard against the worst that can happen, legislatively and, and, and in regulation. But we also must imagine the best that can happen so we can protect that. And Berkman is, is a key actor in doing that. There are many benefits to publicness. They include um, making and improving relationships. It includes uh, bringing trust. It's, I think we'll come to the point where if you're hiding things, we'll wonder why you're hiding things, certainly as corporations and governments, not as individuals. Um, it, um, publicness enables collaboration. Once you are open, once you put out a beta in a product, then that enables the collaboration that can then occur around that. Uh, publicness disarms the notion of a stranger. Uh, and publicness also, I think, disarms stigmas. Uh, I believe that gays and lesbians use publicness as their best weapon against the bigots who would force them into closets. And I don't say for a second that anyone should be forced out of a closet should be dragged out, that anything private in your head should be dragged out. But those who had the bravery to stand outside those closets and dare those bigots and say, you got a problem with this, as we say in New Jersey, um, used publicness, I think, to great end to uh, fight down those stigmas. The publicness, in my view, has many benefits. I think we have to look at those benefits separately for individuals, companies, and government, uh, because they are very different. Um, in government, I think that uh, we are too often now secret by default and open by force, whether that force is WikiLeaks or a FOIA or a reporter. Uh, it should be the opposite. Government should be transparent by default and secret by necessity. And there are necessary secrets. Make no mistake about that. I would never say the same thing about an individual. Uh, I don't think we should be public by default or private by default. I think we should. Have, the, the default is that we always have choice. We preserve that choice uh, to do what we want to do when we want to do it. Recognizing, however, the benefits to ourselves and to society in sharing. I think that we've gotten to this strange view of Facebook that it's a place to put secrets. Let's make it clear that the internet is a shitty place to put secrets. It is the last place you should ever put a secret. Um, uh, people go to Facebook to share. Now, of course, Facebook made mistakes around privacy. They made mistakes by making you think that you were talking to these people and then finding out you were actually talking to those people. It's like, it's like that nightmare in high school where you, you suddenly, you know, you imagine you tell the girl you love her right next to the microphone uh, for the PA system or something, right? So, so Facebook has made mistakes in that way, but 800 million people have joined not because they're insane and not because they're drunk, but because they want to share. When I interviewed Zuckerberg, he believes that he is not changing human nature, but that he's enabling human nature. And, and I think he's right. I think that we are social by nature. We want to share, and this is a new tool to enable us to do that. But I do believe that we need the choice at that level to decide. Um, and it's our own choice. After blogging about my prostate cancer, one person who didn't like me anyway, there are a few of those, um, accused me of oversharing, which is a very odd word, very odd concept, oversharing. What it really means is that he was telling me to shut up. Right? He was telling me he didn't want to hear what I had to say. But the beauty of our social architecture today is there's many cures for that. He can unfollow me. He can defriend me. He can not click on me. Um, instead, so, so he told me to, to, to shut up. And the problem thus, I think, was not that I was oversharing, but instead that he was over-listening uh, <laughs> to me. So we need those choices. You can make mistakes. We do need to train uh, young people and learn from young people, as Dana Boyd would say, how to control meaning and how to control um, uh, what we want to control and use these tools to our own ends. Companies, I think, would be well to share a lot more uh, because it, it opens up the notion of the ability to collaborate. There's a company called Local Motors. Now, in my last book, What Would Google Do? Out in paperback now. Um, sorry. Uh, I, 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 I speculated about the idea of a collaboratively designed car, and people made fun of me, and they said, Jarvis, that would be the Homer. For those of you who may remember, the Homer was the car Homer Simpson designed that had two bubbles, one for the kids, sealed so you couldn't hear them, with, as I remember, leg irons and shag carpeting and as many cup holders as you could imagine. And it bankrupted his cousin's car company. So, so however, I found this company called Local Motors uh, that is designing cars collaboratively and is making cars collaboratively. And the way it can do that is by doing contests for the design. And they're making their first car in Arizona right now called the Rally Fighter. Uh, it's actually a Boston-based company. And um, they, um, 
have to make the design open so that people can design elements of it. So uh, the, the community came along and, for example, once someone designed a new tail light for it, and the community fell in love and said, oh, we want to have this it's beautiful. And Jay Rogers, the CEO, who was still in charge of making safe and economical cars, said, okay, I've priced out what it would take to um, tool up to make that unique part, and it would add $1,000 to the price of every car. And the community responded as one, never mind. And uh, they went in and looked at other parts, and they picked the $75 Honda taillight lens that was designed into the car in a way I never would have known. Now, that amazes me, because that's a case where the community is making both design and economic decisions collaboratively with the company. Because the company is giving them the tools and means and respect to do so, this is VRM brought to life. Right? Where the co there is, in fact, a community of customers. It really can exist. And, they can, and, and the company benefits from dealing with them. So I think companies have to become a lot more open. Governments, as I said, need to become more transparent. And I could talk about all of that, but I want to skip to the end right now and, and talk about the real point of, of why I wrote this. I, I fear, as people are fearing about privacy, I fear, again, that we could lose some of the power of these tools of publicness if we do not protect them from both companies and especially governments that would want to uh, team them for us. And um, when Google pulled out of China, I think they did the right thing, and I think they stood up for their principles at last. Uh, but can we expect companies to protect the internet? Can we expect Google to protect the internet? Uh, you know, I, I wrote, what would Google do in paperback now? Um, uh, and uh, I'm a certified Google fanboy, but even I don't think that Google is the protector of the net, that any company will protect it. Google turned around and it did a deal with Verizon on um, the um, net neutrality making the wired net neutral and the wireless not, which I think was the creation of the internet and the Schmitternet. Um, uh, so Google did a devil's deal. Uh, even as much as I'm a Google fanboy, no, they can't protect it. Can governments protect the internet? No. Governments fancy themselves the best protectors of our privacy, but they are the greatest threat to our privacy. Uh, governments, uh, they don't understand that if you give the power to one to do something because you think they're good, then all governments can use the same tools and means to do things. Uh, I went to the EG8, as I said earlier, in Paris, and, and I had the uh, temerity to stand up in the crowd and uh, ask Sarkozy to take a Hippocratic oath for the net. First, do no harm. And he dismissed it in, 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 a, in a very French way. And uh, said, ah, is it harm to protect your children and, and your copyright and your privacy? Is it harm? Uh, well, yeah, it could be because there's so many unintended consequences to what we're doing these days. As Dana Boyd has shown, usually I say, David and I agree, there's a statute that says we people of the net have to quote Clay Shirky once a day. And I think three Danas equals one Clay. Um, so Dana just, as you may know, released a great study of the effect of COPPA, the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, uh, and, and the unintended consequences thereof. And she found that in her, in her survey, a majority of, COPPA, as you know, basically says, to oversimplify it, that companies may not use information about children under 13 unless they have the parental consent, and the parental consent involves uh, leaping through um, hula hoops set on fire. Um, parents can't even do it by email. They, in the new regulations, they would have to uh, print out, uh, uh, sign, and scan, or fax, if you know what a fax machine is, uh, things back to the company, or go on a video conference to, to uh, prove their parents. Well, so um, Dana found that, that, that in her sample, more than half of the 12-year-olds had Facebook pages. But what was amazing was it was 70, either 76 or 78 percent of those pages had been created with the help of parents. The unintended consequence of COPPA is that we teach our children to lie. And uh, as the old uh, New Yorker cartoon says, to amend it, no one knows you're a dog on the internet, but on the internet, everyone's 14. Um, and there's other unintended consequences, I believe, uh, that uh, when I, I start, one of the first sites I started on the internet was the yuckiest site on the net uh, about, about goo and, and, and cockroaches and things, just to learn how to do a site. And my company, um, after COPPA came out, said, don't do that again. Don't start a company for kids because the liability is too great. The risk is too great. I believe that COPPA has, has resulted in young people being the worst served sector of society on the internet, and that's a tragedy. We have to look at what we think are well-meaning, what are indeed our well-meaning regulations to try to protect someone from this internet thing and from stranger danger and so on. But it's having a, uh, an effect that is not predicted and that is dangerous. We have to protect 
the net from well-meaning people, but also from tyrants, obviously. So what do we do if it's not going to be government protecting it, and I don't want that, and I don't want a governance of the net, and if it's not going to be companies, which of course wouldn't work, who needs to protect the net? We do. We need the people of the net. Now, how, how do we do that? Um, I thought back to uh, Leon Sullivan's principles, the Sullivan principles that, that he wrote uh, to battle apartheid. And I make very clear here that I'm not equating apartheid and its horrors with cutting out YouTube videos in the country. But as you know, the Sullivan principles he wrote so that, that companies that were doing business in South Africa had to uh, match these principles of human rights. Uh, and if they didn't, they were required to pull out. And if they didn't do that, then hell would come as uh, demonstrations on campuses and so on and bo boycotts and such would occur. And it had an impact on apartheid. And indeed, Sullivan's principles are still the key principles of corporate responsibility today. So I think we need a discussion about the principles of an open and public society and net. And I emphasize the word discussion because we will never come to a to a, an agreement, we will never you know, ratify it as a whole, nor should we, it's impossible on the net. But by having the discussion, I think we start to discern things that start to matter to many of us, and that when a government or when a company violates one of these principles, we have something to point to. Look how angry people are about this. So I propose some principles, they are wrong, I'll say that up front, they're absolutely wrong, but I'd, I'll throw mine into the, into the ring. And there are other efforts to, to come up with a bill of rights here, uh, but I just make it principle. And they are these. First, that we have a right to connect. That doesn't mean that we necessarily pay for your connection, but if your connection is cut off, then can we agree that that's a violation of your human rights, Mr. Mubarak? Or Mr. Sarkozy, cutting off a connection uh, for three strikes and you're out on copyright. That is a necessary preamble to our First Amendment and a right to speak. And the third right follows out of that, of course, which is a right to assemble and act, see Occupy Wall Street. Um, next, I think we have to look at Personally, at privacy as an ethic of knowing and publicness as an ethic of sharing. We have to have discussions about that and understand what, what we want to protect in those areas. But let's discuss them before we jump to regulation. I may sound like a libertarian, but I'm not. I'm a Democrat. Um, and next is uh, that uh, what's public is a public good. In Germany, when they, uh, the head of consumer protection, Ilse Eigner, urged Germans to get uh, Google to pixelate their homes in Google Street View. Uh, 244,000 Germans went along and did that. And uh, they exercised, the Germans being the Germans, they made up a word for this. Uh, it is the Verpixel Unsrecht, the right to be pixelated. <laughs> and uh, when Street View came out, I thought, OK, this is funny, right? I laughed too. But you saw it, and you saw it, and suddenly you go across a lovely German landscape, and there was just suddenly this horrible fog of pixels. And it was a desecration of the digital landscape. And it, what principles are at work there? Google was being pressured to not take a picture from a public place of a public view. And that leads to a whole bunch of issues about this notion that you can have a presumption of privacy in public. I, I find that frightening. Right now, there, as, you, as, you, as you know, there's um, discussion of such a right for police officers in regards to audio recording in Illinois. I, I find that offensive. That, and Massachusetts too? Um, I want to go out and record them right now. Um, I figured, anyway, you'd know. We will come to that. Um, right, so, so, so that notion of a presumption of privacy in public, I, I think, risks reducing the public, what's public, and thus the value of it to us, the public. Also, just in the case of for Pixel um, who, if you need permission to take a picture of a building from the outside, from the street, who grants the permission? The resident, the owner, the builder, the architect maybe is the most likely to do it. You know, who owns that image? People say in Germany, well, Google's making money off my, my building. Okay, well, if I come along and I am an artist, and I take a beautiful picture of that building and I make money, is that bad? You know, what are the principles at work here? So what public is public good, uh, our institution's information, not our individual, but our institution's information should become public by default and uh, private by necessity. Uh, the last two are um, that all bits are created equal. That's obviously net neutrality. And it took me a while to come to that and understand that if a bit 
is detoured or stopped, whether that's by Mubarak shutting off the internet or Iran shutting off services or China stopping searches or Comcast forcing me to go to this application instead of that application. If any bit is not free, then no bits can be presumed to be free. And finally, the last one is that the internet must remain open and distributed because that's what makes it the net. The fact that no one can have sovereignty over the net makes the net the net. And uh, that's what confounds, confuses, and frightens institutions in power because it is necessarily disruptive, but that's our net. And there's a tool of publicness that we all have to be able to change society. Now, last point. I am not a techno-determinist. I don't believe that technology is necessarily going to turn out for the good. Technology is going to be used for good or bad, and that's just the point. We are at a point of choice. And we need to be able to maintain those choices and have those choices. And if we don't protect them, I fear that companies and well-meaning and ill-meaning governments will take away that power of that choice that we have to build our future society. And I know of no other institution, and I mean this, anywhere in a better position to start that protection, to be part of that protection, because it's already happening right here at Berkman. Berkman is the leading institution of understanding the power of the net for all of us. And back to Sarkozy at his EG8, I, I, I don't blame him. I was there with, with Lawrence Lessig, uh, who, who, who said to the assembled uh, Bachers that the future of the internet is not here because it didn't know how to get invited. <laughs> and, and it was right. right. And Susan Crawford and Yochai Benkler uh, and and we, we were there, but we were kind of saying we're not really here. We don't really agree, uh, but we wanted to let them know that not everyone agrees. But I don't blame Sarkozy for holding the event and inviting us to his table. What I blame is us, the people of the net, for not having our own event, our we G8, and inviting Sarkozy to the table. Because it's our table. The internet is ours, not theirs. But if we let them have it, then it, we have ourselves to blame. So that's what I have to say. And I'm eager for a conversation, and I will play Oprah and run around like a fool. So surely this crowd is not one where I have to wait for someone to argue with me. Ah, good. Real names. Uh, first, uh, anonymity has its important place. Oh, I'd actually like to do it. I'm Oprah. I'm Phil. I look like Phil, don't I? Um, the hair. It's for the webcast, so that's why. Even so, it's not on. Okay. So the question was, what about uh, Google Plus's real names uh, uh, kerfuffle? First, anonymity has its place online. Um, it, it, it necessarily protects the, uh, the vulnerable in society, and especially in tyrannies. It protects whistleblowers, and so on. Um, uh, pseudonyms have their place online. But I also understand the desire to, have, to follow the key insight of Facebook, which is that real people and real relationships are good and improve the discourse. And Google wants to have um, real people. So I get that. I get the motivation. But they screwed it up because they were uh, far too um, literal in the notion of what a person's identity is. So Dr. Kiki, the podcaster, that's how I know her. That's how I find her. And if I can't find her on that pseudonym, I don't know who she is. And so there are reasons to have other structures. I think Google knows it now. And what they're struggling with is a principle and a system for how to enable people to be themselves, whatever that definition of themselves is. And when I talked to them about this, uh, when I was out there for the book tour, um, you know, one of them said, yeah, we want real people and real relationships. That was the point. You know, they kind of know this is not the route, so they don't know how to get there. Um, but I also understand not having the place overrun by fake identities and spam, because it's happening now. Right? I see all these identities coming in there. And they use it for spam, and they ruin the community. So the, 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 the host of the community has some role in trying to improve what the community is. I get all that, but they've got to come up with a better system. And I'm glad I don't have to. Uh, 
Um, I want to talk about um, Google Street View and the Germans. And I mean, I think there's an underlying principle there that you're not quite getting Don't speak at. Speak up because that's not. Oh, gonna, yes. that's not gonna... um, I mean, it's another dimension of scale. I mean, it's one thing for somebody to come by mm -hmm. and take a picture for their own purposes um, of your house. It's another thing for Google to send a car by every street, um, you know, in the country, take pictures and put it up for the world. And somewhere in there, people's ethic of privacy kicks in, or at least for some people. Um, and, you know, I, talking about it as a desecration of the digital landscape, um, yeah, all metaphors are wrong, but I don't think this one, this one works. It's not really, I mean, there isn't a digital landscape to desecrate. I mean, the other way to phrase this is people opting out of, um, you know, street view, and you know, we all have choices. Um, and why isn't that a valid choice? But, but if they own the building, do they own the view of it? That's the problem. This is a public view, right? And, and, and the principle is that if you tell me that I cannot take a picture from a public place of a public view, will you also tell journalists that? Well, they have a panorama of freedom. Will you also tell citizens that? Um, that's the problem here is we have to deal with principles. But you're right about scale. Scale in terms of the size of databases, data coming together, those, that, that is different. I, 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 I stipulate that. But I still think we have to protect the principle here. And to me, the principle of this is that what's public is a public good. And um, that if you diminish that, you diminish what the public owns. And I think it's out of an emotional response. So I have a follow on to this. It's, it's, the, it's just not working. It's for the, it's, no, 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 it's for, the, it's for the webcast. Oh, OK, all right. It's all for right. the world to hear you. Ah, very important. Um, anyway. So I have a, a real world example of what the unintended consequence of Google, Google Street View is. So um, we have a vacation rental. And so our, the, the website that says you put up a calendar for the days that it's rented and the days that it's not rented. So the, any bad guy can come and find out what your house looks like and know when it's not going to be occupied. We actually had a rash of uh, thefts where they, you know, do a BB gun into your glass door and, and get in and steal the TVs or whatever. So it's the unintended consequences. And, and I'm not saying that we should have government say you can't do it. I think then it's like the challenges. Then how do you figure, okay, like how I figured it out was basically you just always have your house occupied even, you know, like three days out, you know it's not rented, you have it occupied. So, I mean, there's things that people can do, but I think it's stuff like that that gets people very nervous. Well, let me give you another example here. Uh, Riverhead, I think, Long Island, uh, had uh, used Google Earth to look for pools and backyards that had not been, um, did not have permits for them, right? And there was, of course, an outcry. Oh my God, what are you doing? Well, but let's think about that. They stopped. Children die in pools. If that neighbor doesn't have a fence around the pool, I want to know that, and I want it to get fixed by the town. And if this is a better way to find that out, I'm okay with that. But it seems like a government, you know, big brother, stupid in the sky. Part of this, again, is coming to new norms and new ways to adjust this as society. So, you know, you're right that there, it's also just reality. The truth is that, that anybody can sit in front of the house and find this out, right? Does it go to scale? Yes. But are people in Munich going to come over and rob your house? No, it's probably your schmucky neighbors anyway who are doing it, right? So it's still you know, the case. It's not a question of scale in this case. It's a question of, 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 of trying to figure out, you know, they're just being clever like spammers to figure out new ways. Could you talk, <clears throat> excuse me, could you talk a little bit about two terms that you use um, almost interchangeably, uh, which are norms and ethics? So we have privacy at, if, uh, in your definition as an ethic uh, of, of knowing. But I, I know you're also, also very interested in, um, in how norms play out across the web. And those two terms, norms and ethics, no, are no, not, they're no. not the same. No, they're not. So are, to what extent is privacy a norm, or should it be a norm? To what extent is it uh, an ethic? I think privacy as an ethic should inform the norms that we come up with, right? Uh, publicness as an ethic should inform the norms. The norms are just simply what's normal, what we do, right? That, would that be a fair definition of a norm? Right? So it could be bad, it could be unethical, it could be wrong, it could be something that we want to change, uh, that the norm of certain people is to go break into houses, you know, whatever. Right? So, so a norm is not necessarily ethical, but 
as we are trying to refigure how society operates. We were talking, uh, David and I, I had the privilege of having lunch, breakfast with David this morning, and we're talking about uh, email and contact. And I, I, I'm wishing for the return of the busy signal, right? Because uh, there's no way, people always assume that you are always there and you have no way around it, right? And so what happens now? Um, people send me a lot of email, and my, my lie, my norm to deal with this was, oh, uh, my email got broken, but nobody believes that anymore because I have Google. So then the next lie was, oh, it got caught in the spam filter, right? And the next thing people do, Fred Wilson, the venture capitalist, says that unless Google puts you up in, in priority inbox, he won't answer you. He won't see it, which is which the next. So the next line is, oh, Google didn't think you were important, <laughs> right? Um, I know somebody else who is trying to deal with email by saying basically unless he recognizes it personally as important, he's got to wait until the second or third time that you email because you've got to care enough to get to him. So these are new norms we're trying to figure out about what is clearly an overload of contact. contact. There's no ethic involved there. Well, there is. There is kind of. How do we treat people? Are we rude? What's considered rude? And so on. But So I, I'm not suggesting that, that they're the same. I do use them a little too interchangeably. Hey there, how are you? So could you talk a little bit about um, sort of having things shared for you? I mean, when you talked about the prostate cancer thing, it reminded me of one time I was picking my child up from camp and I couldn't find the mother's phone number of this kid he was on a play date for, so I, but I knew her name and I found her online and found this whole memoir she wrote about the prostate issues around her ex-husband's operation, which was suddenly much more than actually I had wanted to know, even though I know it's over listening now, which is a really great phrase. <laughs> and you did listen, didn't you? You read it, didn't you? It was, it was mesmerizing, <laughs> but uh, it was, I, and I felt really bad for reading it. But, um, but I, mean, I don't think he actually wanted that shared. Um, but I think also in the more futuristic sense, there's the issues around people posting photos mm -hmm. of each other, and increasingly as face recognition starts to replace uses of names, there'll be enormous amounts of information shared about us. So I was wondering what you had to say. Right. Well, I think, again, we're trying to adjust to this as a society and figure out what, what's proper. Um, Facebook, you know, it, now if David takes a picture of me and posts it and tags me, Facebook gives me, tells me and gives me the opportunity to say, no, don't tag me, which is better than you'd find on Flickr or blogs or anywhere else, right? So Facebook's trying to come up with some ways that reach this. Is any, is any control complete? No, not at all. Um, you know, the problem of having your information, I think there's a few lines here. If information is tricked, if somebody tricks you to get the information out of you, that's what's wrong. If someone uh, violates what is a presumed confidence, right, there was a context here where the ex-wife is getting back to the ex-husband, I think, saying, questioning his abilities, uh, then, then, you know, whether that happens via online or any other means, it's the same sin, right? It could happen with a whisper as well. Um, I'll give you a, a harder example, is um, Tyler Clemente, the young student at Rutgers whose picture was allegedly taken by his roommate as he was uh, in embrace of another man, and then he committed suicide off the George Washington Bridge, a terrible, horrible thing. Um, and, and I went at the time, I was, I was summoned to go to the CBS Evening News with Katie Couric to say, you know, admit this is a teachable moment for the internet. You know, fine it is, but the truth is that sin could have been committed with a postcard, a phone call, a whisper. Yes, it goes more scale and it's faster online, but the sin, what's, what's wrong, what we, what we should regulate there is the human f failure, not necessarily the technology. We're, we're jumping to the technology's fault, when I still think it's, it's a human fault. The ex-wife did something wrong here. She used technology to do so, but she could have also you know, put out a newsletter with a mimeograph machine. Slight difference in terms of scale, absolutely, but the sin, the frailty of the human nature is the same. But let's also go to something else here, though. I think that part of what we do, uh, we were talking about, about health earlier, and uh, yeah, nobody necessarily wants to hear about my penis, but um, you know, I, I, I told the world for a reason and I have no regrets for doing so. Why don't we share all of our health? It would be a better world if we did. If we all shared all of our health and all of our sickness, then we would have more opportunity to get support from people. We would have um, the ability to uh, get data that could lead to correlations that in turn could lead to cures or, or prevention. Uh, we could do amazing things if we were all healthy. Why aren't we? Well, number one is because of health insurance. Though 
The truth is they can already get your information anyway because they require you to hand it over. Number two is jobs. But we could legislate that. We could say that you can't dis discriminate on the basis of sickness. The real reason, in the end, is stigma. And that's the problem we've got to grapple with as a society, is that in this day and age, for anyone to be ashamed of being sick is pathetic. Right? For anyone to be able to use a sickness against someone else says more about society, I think, than it says about the sickness itself, the ailment itself. And, and so in this age of publicness and the ability to be public, I think we've got to examine ourselves in new and different ways that go beyond that kind of individual case and say, well, why is that a problem as it happens? And I think a piece of it is that a, a large part of your message is that public, publicness is our best weapon in the fight against stigma. That's part of it, yeah. Um, but I think the, just a, a quick yeah. follow-up is that I think a lot of those issues on sharing, I, the example I gave was pertinent but not the best one, are very well-meaning. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, we can certainly say vicious oversharing to hurt someone is a bad thing, but there's sort of ubiquitous sharing of all kinds of information with unintended consequence, sort of like the photographs of, of Google Street View that pick up someone's party or something. Right. So I guess that was the intent of the question. I'll let someone else. Um, I'm Norwegian, and in Norway, um, the government makes public uh, what everybody makes. Your tax return is public information. Uh, some newspapers have created Facebook applications, which will take all your Facebook friends, map out how much money they make and where they are, and make that available. And there is no way you can opt out of that, mm -hmm. because this um, requirement to um, publish how much you make was made in a day of when you actually had to go down to the city hall to take a look at it, and people wouldn't do it for not being seen as snoops. Now everybody can. Um, so, you know, I, I'd like you to talk a little bit about this, this notion of two things that are very central to the debate in Europe. One is information being collected for one purpose, mm -hmm. but being used for another. The second big issue in Europe, which is to be debated now, is, is, is the so-called data storage directive, mm -hmm. which says that the government will store what email you sent, what IP addresses you used, um, all your telephone conversations, uh, I mean, the metadata, not the content for a period varying between six months and two years in case you do something mm -hmm. uh, bad. And the reason they do it is because you know, telephone companies no longer store that information to the same extent because more and more calls are being fixed. So sort of the notion, information being used for something else that it's collected for, and this notion of storing things just in case. Right. So. Um Helen Nissenbaum at New York University argues that her key principle and definition of privacy is context. And I think she's right intellectually. I think it's very hard, though, to necessarily um, enforce that, to figure out what the context is and to know what the context is in, 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 a, in a, a million different cases. Um, if the information is being, again, tricked out of you, but in the case of the Norwegian um, income, it's not being tricked out of you. As you say, it just has a new use. Now, I've heard from friends in Norway that there's now reconsideration of doing this because of all this, right? Um, but I still have to think that there was a cultural benefit to doing it in the first place that it's also a shame to lose. Right? There was an openness that was seen to be a good part of the culture and, and, and so on. Um, was this, I, I lost the second half, I lost the end half. Oh, data storage, right. Um, Google, I mean, Google and Germany are not a match made in heaven. Right, and, and, but Google threatened to pull Gmail out of Germany because they were putting such data storage requirements on Google that it went over Google's limit. Um, uh, we, this goes to the notion of, of security in general. Right? How much do we care about security? How much are we willing to go? Uh, is it security, if we get past the security theater question, to say is there a legitimate reason for a government to know things to keep us safe? and do crime or not. I think that we come back to principles, and to me, email has less protection in this country, correct me if I'm wrong, attorneys, than mail, right? Why is that? To me, the principle here is that our communication that is intended to be private uh, is um, uh, private and that it should be protected. And that if you want to get a wiretap, 
uh, on our phones, the next layer of this, which you had to go through these steps, and of course we know in this country that's, that's being watered down a bit. Um, uh, but at some level, society still grapples with this notion of security, right? So the, 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 the overhead pictures of the pools, what's more important, creepy notions of the pools or saving kids' lives? Well, we've got to have that discussion and figure that out. Um, so data retention, to me, is dangerous from government, indeed. And uh, government fancies itself its best protector of us. But government is in the best position to use our information against us. So personally, I don't like that. I don't like that kind of, uh, that kind of data retention requirement. Um, uh, but I think that we still have things like wiretaps. We still have other means to get at people's information. And so the, we're, we're, we're necessarily just moving the line and saying where that line is. And the line is never going to be pure. What sort of gets my goat, and I'm, I'm a member of a group who's suing the Norwegian government for the, to test the constitu constitutionality of, of that requirement, what gets my goat is every time you introduce something new like that, you also say, yes, this will help in the fight against crime and making people, but nobody ever sets targets. Right. So you can tell whoever, the police, whoever it is, say, you know, we expect a 20% down, you know, if you haven't achieved that within five years, well, we'll mm -hmm. stop doing this mm -hmm. because it simply isn't working. Yeah. So that might be one way out of it. So, hi. hi. I'm intrigued by your premise of public by default and private by necessity for institutions, which I think is a great one. And I'm really watching with interest the open government movement and the release of big data and how that's enabled you know, third party developers to create great apps like Catch That Bus. I'm wondering, where do you see the low hanging fruit for universities in being public by default uh -huh. and private by necessity? Uh -huh. Good point. Um, let me first give a, another point to, to Larry Lessig here, because he argues that if we only used government information to get the bastards, then government will treat transparency as an enemy. And so we need to use government information to be collaborative and to build society. And these are examples where it encourages government to do that. And um, Beth Novick uh, ran the peer to patent system to try to improve our fucked up patent structure by being more open. Uh, so um, I think that that's where we have to move with government transparency. Universities, I believe, will be in the next wave of disruption from the net, right? And uh, because the, the cost is ridiculous, the structure just doesn't work, it, it's not efficient. Um, um, look at this example. Around the world, how many instructors in a given year write a lecture about capillary action? And how many of them are crap, right? And so the fact that you have open courseware starting with MIT and Stanford and now other universities allows you to find the best lectures in the world, far more efficient. You can then encourage the best. You can reward the best. Is there still a role for local education? Yes, more like tutoring. So it's more like an Oxford model of lecture and tutor, but it happens at a distance. What does that do to the size of the institution and the way the institution operates? Carried to his logical extension, it utterly disrupts it. Because why should I be stuck with the instructors of one institution? I should be able to take instruction from any institution, right? Uh, why should I be stuck? In, why should the instructor be stuck with the students who, who were accepted at that college? They should be able to go from anywhere. Why should we waste all this effort and this money when we supposedly want to educate more people? I'm reading. Um, Anya Kamenetz's book, uh, DIYU, right now, finally. I'm, I'm way late on that. But it's wonderful, right, trying to go through this question of why do we want to educate people in society and what do we need to get. And also, I believe we get to a point where the disruption to every industry and society is going to need a huge requirement of re-education of people for new skills, uh, if we're lucky. And we're not set up to do that. We're set up for this certifi certification project uh, of, of turning out people exactly the same. So I think universities will be changed, not because of some ethic that I talk about. That's, that's I think, actually ra rather irrelevant to them. I, I think it's more going to be changed because of the economics of education. I, I was uh, pretty interested about your idea about we the people. It came uh, a couple of times in your talk. I, was, I thought it was interesting because you're really involved in all this. And it's a view from the insiders. It's, it's a view from the people from the net see themselves as the people from the net like we. So I thought it was interesting. I thought it was interesting also from a social scientist perspe perspective. How would you 
look at it if you are a social scientist or something. Also, like we the people, it's what's the scale of analysis for us? That would be the interaction, the interaction between the people. And I know that like that's a thing like people in Berkman here are thinking a lot. You know, maybe we're still on the social interaction, but what it is with the internet. And you mentioned like stigma, so it ring the bell of Goffman for me. Erwin Goffman was saying actually, you were saying about control and power for information. He's always using the term mostly uh, management of information in public spaces. And I think the book is very old, but I think there's a lot up there. Especially you didn't really address the idea of fame. Who's famous and who's not on the web. I think it was very interesting for your own example about the cancer. If I say I got a cancer on my Facebook page, uh, that's going to be a way to reach my friend, but that's all. I mean, and I'm not really famous at all. And so I, I think that it's interesting between, because uh, a Goffman is actually draw, um, using a lot of idea about famous, how people that are famous or researched by police, you put them on the same scale, uh, management personal information. I think that's basically it, just the, with the people, with Big Brother, the Big Brother idea, I think like it comes a lot with what you said earlier, is that we're looking at each other. It's no longer the state. That comes along with we the people. It's not the state who's looking what your house look like uh, on Google Street View on a daily basis and stuff. And your personal information that you're managing, I always amazed about Facebook and all the stuff because it's real different from public spaces in the term of Goffman where you go there and everyone see what's going on. And you have no, um, you cannot manage some information. And that's where the stigma is. On Facebook, you choose what you put there. So I'm always amazed about this new kind of public spaces. But at the same time, with government, you can you, uh, choose to stay at home, and you can choose not go on the web, I guess. Yeah, what, what I think you're, you're going around here in various ways is the notion of what a public is. And I think that we, we got a um, skewed, a corrupted view of, of a public in the sense that it was a mass, that it was everyone. So fame means that everyone knows you. Being public means you're talking to everyone because that's what media did. But what the tools of publicness enable us to do is to create publics, right? create limited publics around things. So on Facebook, a better example perhaps is Google Plus. So Google Plus, you can create a circle and share with that circle. Now once again, the problem here is I think people are assuming that's a way to be private. It's not because if I tell it to David and he's a horrible gossip, it will still get around the world. You know, I didn't protect it in any way. The internet again being a shitty place to put secrets. Um, the reason I use a circle is because I don't want to bore everyone outside the circle. It's about relevance. So it allows me to create a circle of journal, journal geeks and I have my boring journalism things just to them or my German friends and if it's in German, all my Americans hate that, right? So I'm trying to cr create relevance. Facebook enabled you to create your private public, kind of, right? Your, your, your closed group. And I think what Facebook made the mistake of doing was mixing the idea of a public and the public. That when you went into Facebook, you were creating a public, your public. And then when Facebook changed the defaults, so suddenly you were talking to the public. They're not the same sense of public, right? Talking to, to, to a public, to your public, is still public. It's public to that extent, right? So whether you're using a public in the sense of revealing things, or a public in the sense of organizing core interest, right? Um, that's not in the media sense. When we come to government at some point, I believe that besides universities being disrupted, the notion of a nation gets disrupted at some point. Right? We're at a point now where you know, the, 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 the Indignados, the Arab Spring, and Occupy Wall Street probably have more in common and more sense of loyalty among themselves than they do to their own nations. Uh, you can have a nation of vegetarians. I'm sure there's many, many members here in Cambridge. Um, you know, you can have a nation of various interests. And do we still, you know, it was after Gutenberg that the notion of the nation, and other, other things, that the notion of the nation changed and came in, right? The notion of what the public is. Do we have one public? Well, we have to at certain times when we vote, but otherwise I'm not part of the same public as everybody here. We're part of different publics. And we have the ability now to each of us organize those publics. I want to come back to the ethics versus norms issue. You're not letting me off the hook. Um, well, not entirely, because um, ethics sounds as if they should be transcultural, and norms, by their nature, are community-based. They're much smaller things, and norms we think of as being, oh, it's a matter, it, um, 
lots of different norms are equally acceptable, whereas ethics, no, there's sort of one ethics. So to, um, one of the things about norms, though, is that they define the publics that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. They're defined by norms, and the fact that uh, we dress fairly modestly here in Cambridge, even when it's, when it's warm out, um, that's something that we do. Another culture has a different sense of modesty, and we, we don't, uh, one group is more or less free talking about their sex lives or their, how much money they make and all the rest of it. Those norms define, help to define what a public is. So do you lose, are you arguing for a single set of privacy where the best thing would be for the norm to be naked, I mean literally naked, mm -hmm. and you cover up as a matter of necessity? Mm -hmm. um, or are you, what's driving, what's the, sort of the universal and trans norm um, features of publicness that we should adopt so that you can argue with somebody, no, your norms are wrong. Your norms about uh, privacy in Germany, they're mistaken. They have bad effects. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What's the substrate that we are, is it really just, uh, just the wrong word, is it that publicness is better than privacy unless there are exceptional circumstances and that's where we, that, that's our starting position? Though I argue for default publicness when it comes to government institutions, I do not argue it for the individual. Neither do I argue for default privacy. The head of data protection in Germany wants to have default to privacy. Well, I don't like that very much either because it, it, it says that, you know, taken to its full extent, we all become the Unabomber, right? Not for, for publics, though. So you've got, right. um, not for the, the individual has choice because we're good liberal, you know, mm -hmm. uh, um, but for the, for the entity that has the norms, whose norms are, you know, community, base one way or another, They're, they are definitive publics. Is there, um, is there the same degree of choice of norms for communities and publics as there is for individuals in your view? Well, don't we have societal norms now? And don't we have American societal norms that cut across America? And the, you know, the, the example I use with Germany is they go into the saunas and they're naked and we would consider that to be horrible here, um, right? So, so you have societal norms that cut most of society and that are accepted and if you're an exception to that, you know you're an exception so to it. Is our norm of relative modesty is that wrong? No, I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm not trying to say it's ethical or unethical. No, I'm not trying to say that at all. I, I, the norm that I want is that we respect choice at an individual level, right? But there are buts to that, right? But what's public, what's already public is public. And, and that's why I argue in terms of the Fair Pixel Lungs Act, right? Um, I'm still not answering your question. Uh, well, I'm also not asking very well. No, 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 you're, 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 really, really interesting. Yeah, I, I, I mean, part of the answer is I don't know, right? The, part of the answer is that we're, we're trying to grapple with this now. The other question is, do you end up with universal norms because the internet is universal? When I talked about privacy with a bunch of German editors at the site, one of them said, okay, yeah, we're a little bit uh, passionate about privacy here in Germany. But he said, my daughters aren't that way. My daughters act, operate more like citizens of the net than of Germany. Is there a single uh, society and norm of the internet? I don't think so, um, because I don't, I don't that's, that's a mask gone mad, right? And I, and I don't think we end up with that, and that's a tyranny of the mass gone mad. I want choice. I want to protect choice. But, the, but my argument is, I also want to protect the choice of publicness. Because what we're doing to the tools is we're making the default of the tools more and more through regulation private. Right? If we do, do, do not track, for example, in advertising, we are affecting media and the economics of media in a way that I think could hurt media uh, because we're defaulting to private. But we also need to consider other means. I mean, this will continue online. Uh, no. Out, out, or? It actually comes right off the coattails of what you just said in terms of internet tracking and advertisement. Mm -hmm. I know that you said that government is in the worst position to protect us on the net because they're in the biggest position to abuse that power. But do you see any solution to that, that data aggregation that could really threaten our personal privacy and our right to keeping our information private and our right to keep our information anonymous um, in terms of tracking and aggregation? Do you see that any other solution other than government regulation? Great question. Which when people say that, they're buying time for an answer. Um, I think that whether it comes from self-regulation or regulation, there is a need for transparency about what information people get from you, what they do with it, and your rights to be able to get to it. 
right? And I think, for example, in media and advertising, we have done a horrible, horrible job of telling people what we do, why we're doing it, what they could get out of it. And so they brought on to themselves the regulation that's occurring. The regulation still, I think, is, has unintended consequences. It just Today, the privacy commissioner in Canada required that sites give you an easy opt-out to tracking. Well, that would mean the New York Times could not operate the way it operates, because the New York Times requires you to have cookies to be in the site. Um, so that has an impact on their business. Uh, so I think that it starts with the need for transparency. If they're not transparent, do we need regulation? We might. We might. Is that it? That's it. Oh, that's it. Thank you.